Eco Justice Radio here on 90.7 KPFK. My name is JP Morris, and today we have an interview hosted by Carrie Kim. She'll be talking to Joanna Macy. But first, words from the front. And this week's words from the front is brought to you by Sabina Virgo. This is Sabina Virgo from SoCal 350 and the Martin Luther King Coalition of Greater Los Angeles. Next Monday, January 15th, was Dr. King's birthday. There is traditionally a parade on this day, which the Martin Luther King Coalition of Los Angeles has participated in about every other year. We've participated to bring back the issues that Dr. King fought for to a parade that has been corporatized and militarized. This year, we will be marching with the Poor People's Campaign, fighting against systemic racism, systemic poverty, the war economy, and ecological devastation. We will be fighting for the end of criminalization of communities of color, for new jobs, new energy, and a new economy, for defense of the treaty rights and sovereignty of Native nations, and defending the civil rights and human rights of women and people of color. There, we have a 10-point justice agenda in the Martin Luther King Coalition. This march will be an opportunity for activists and organizers from the climate movement to meet and march with other activists from other aspects of the justice movement. The march begins early, about 10 o'clock. We will be gathering at 8 or 9 o'clock in the vicinity of Western and Martin Luther King. The exact place has not yet been given. The telephone number that you can call is 310 410- Four five five nine three eight nine. ask for Julie, or go to the Facebook page for the Martin Luther King Coalition of Greater Los Angeles. Go either to the event page or March for Humanity on the Facebook page for more information. Thanks, Sabina. And now our interview with Joanna Macy. You're listening to Eco Justice Radio here on 90.7 KPFK. Aloha. You're listening to Eco Justice Radio on 90.7 KPFK. My name is Carrie Kim, and today we are honored to be joined by Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy, eco-philosopher and Buddhist scholar. She has dedicated her life to the study of Buddhism, general systems theory, and deep ecology. A visionary leader, grassroots organizer, and compassionate voice, she's committed five decades to the movements for peace, justice, and ecology. She founded The Work That Reconnects, a groundbreaking framework and methodology for personal and social change. She's the author of numerous books, including Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy, written with Chris Johnstone. She's empowered thousands of people worldwide to transform the despair and apathy caused by overwhelming social and ecological crises into constructive, collaborative action. She invites others to invoke a new way of seeing the world to support the continuance of life. Welcome, Joanna. Hi, Carrie. So glad to be with you. We are thrilled to have you with us. You've been involved for many, many years translating the work of poet Reiner Maria Rilke. And we are wondering if you could share with us the sonnet to Orpheus, which you've said has helped you a great deal in this time. Yes, it has. It was written in the 1920s, close before his early death. And uh, I hope it'll... I'd be delighted to share it because I think it's contagious in its sense of perseverance. So here goes. Thank you. Quiet friend who has come so far. Feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. And as you ring... What batters you becomes your strength. So move back and forth into the changes. What's it like, this intensity of pain? Oh, if the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if the world has 
cease to hear you say to the silent earth, I flow and to the rushing water speak, I am. So pertinent, so relevant for right now. Thank you so much for those words. It's uh, very powerful for us to hear that. You know, I wanted to go back in time to 65 when you were in India with your husband working with the Peace Corps. As over, well, uh, you know, half a century ago now, believe it or not, you recounted as one of your most profound experiences even to this day and as something more real than you had ever uh something more real than anything you'd ever experienced, and I'm wondering why. Yeah, well, I, I still, it still strengthens me by, as, as I remember it and as I breathe with it. And, and it was uh, uh, an experience of uh, being, uh, ex- being bigger than my, the self that I'd become accustomed to think of was Joanna, uh, that this was uh, bigger than uh, the bag of skin that separated me from the world, that there was, uh, just as uh, the Buddha had said, and just as deep ecology says about the ecological self, we are far bigger, our selves are far more extensive than this socially constructed uh, skin-encapsulated ego. hmm Can you share what you experienced working with the Tibetan refugees out there and their notion of self? That they uh, weren't trapped in um, watching themselves to see how good or how correct or how upbeat or how discouraged. They had lost everything. They had faced death and snow blindness as they crossed over the high Himalayan passes and carrying and put all they had on their backs. and and uh, But there was no self-pity. Boy, did that hit me. Mm-hmm. Be free of always watching yourself and judging yourself. And am I good enough, or am I strong enough, or am I whatever enough? Mm-hmm. And to identify yourself simply with the privilege of being alive now in this moment and the privilege of having a choice of how to be. That's liberation. Absolutely. Yeah, you've spoken so much about the hyper-individualism of American culture. Yes, I think it, that cripples us far more than we realize. Mm-hmm. And this is a great a beauty of this moment that we're alive in, is that we can begin to experience not only for ourselves, but for others and through what we choose to do, that uh, we can be free of this uh, because that's what the, you know. That's what leads capitalism and the consumer society is built on. Mm-hmm. It's small, needy, never enough, um, never good enough, never pretty enough. No, you don't smell right. You don't look right. You don't drive the right car. Whatever. We keep being reduced to this pathetic notion of our, our whereas, whereas our true nature is vast. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And with that is a. An activist, uh, sure you get discouraged, sure you get frustrated, sure you get angry, but it passes because you realize that in your uh, depths of being, in your, you are far bigger than that. And then when you're that big, when that you experience that larger self, then the earth herself, because our earth is alive, can begin to act through you. Mm-hmm. How do you envision American society breaking free of this notion of a separate self and the pursuit of private fulfillment? I mean, we have selfies, we have McMansions, we have, uh, we're witnessing, you know, sort of a both-and situation where some people are reclaiming uh, more of a communal way of operating in the world and collaborating and others are, are maybe going further down that other path of materialism. Uh, no. Well, we're so, we've been so maimed and... Uh, you know, that it can't be, uh, uh, there'll always be people who will find it harder, and it's, and it's harder when you are yourself uh, hungry or cold or jobless, and it's very hard not to just think of where you're going to get uh, the next meal. Hmm. But we have in power in the White House this 
figure that demonstrates the essential pathos of the uh, ego-identified narcissist. He's taken hyper-individualism to its ridiculous and, and tragic extent, mm-hmm. don't you think? Mm. Yeah, I, I think we've seen that uh, plenty this year. Uh, you know, I have a mentor who calls hope a four-letter word, and you've said there was a time when you avoided using the word hope. So what I, does hope mean to you now? That's, that's true. Well, yeah, because I thought that it was... I, I remember hearing myself say, hope is a killer. For one thing, it takes you out of the present moment, and it makes you uh, be f- f- uh, too... Um, vulnerable to uh, upsets and rejections or difficulties. But a big thing came to me was, and that was just actually in the process of writing the book you mentioned, Active Hope, Mm -hmm. that hope isn't something you have. Mm -hmm. It's something you do. Mm -hmm. And it's there. So that means it's in the actions you choose to take and so you can, uh, it can be something that you do even when you're feeling hopeless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've said hope is a verb, yes? That's right. You, you, this year we've witnessed so many climate-driven natural disasters uh, on an unprecedented scale. And you've said that people can't look at the devastation we're causing to our planet, not because they're apathetic, but actually because they care so much that they have to avoid the pain of the world, that the other face of our pain is our love for the world. So so how do you encourage people to engage the pain and the love? I think the key is to not be afraid of the pain, our moral pain, or our... um, Not be afraid of the suffering that we feel or that, that we inflict on ourselves or on others. Not be afraid of the suffering. We're going to we see plenty of it, and we're going to see more. Mm -hmm. And to realize that our mainstream culture has um, pathologized that pain, presented it as something unfortunate and neurotic. Mm -hmm. If there was some weakness in our separate individual self, maybe we were abused as children or whatever. But actually, uh, to, to, to suffer with the world is a wholesome and indeed beautiful expression of our humanity. Mm-hmm. It's the literal meaning of compassion. Mm-hmm. So we don't, and once we're not afraid of the suffering, then, Carrie, mm-hmm. nothing can stop us. Mm-hmm. So let's stop. Uh, b- feeling so tender about our precious feelings or mm. feel- taking our pulse all the time is how we feel. Of course we're going to feel grief with the griefs of others, mm-hmm. grief of the homeless, with the hungry, with the people who don't have any, still in darkness from the, in Puerto Rico, you know, all over the world. Yeah. When with the non- our non-human brothers and sisters. Of course, but that's part of our solidarity. Absolutely. You're listening to Eco Justice Radio on 90.7 KPFK. Um, Joanna, would you say that without experiencing or allowing us ourselves to feel the grief of the world, and even especially the environmental destruction that we're witnessing, that we can also not feel so much our obligation to it? And if we don't, and or, or much else either. Mm-hmm. We don't allow ourselves to feel our pain for the world, then we're not going to feel that as much joy, or uh, either. Mm-hmm. We get sort of numb. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's and it's, people are afraid that if they feel their suffering for the world, they'll be mired in despair and grief, and that's just the opposite because it's only a feeling, <laughs> and we're only stuck with it if we refuse to feel it, absolutely, or acknowledge it. But it's just a few passes. So some of the, in the work I do around, uh, uh, in the work that we connect, once people ex- express, and oh boy, and it gets loud and crazy and <laughs> wet. And how <laughs> people feel. And then they, it, it also, almost in the next breath, there's hilarity and there's love. And a release, yes, of yeah. everything they're holding. Like coming more alive. 
Would you say that the world's current climate crisis is fundamentally a spiritual crisis? And a, yes, yeah, and a perceptual crisis. I think that we don't allow ourselves to think or come to consciousness around uh, where we are and who we are. Mm-hmm. I mean, that here we are in the most thrilling moment of our planetary journey where both science and spirituality are revealing uh, for almost anyone to see that uh, our Earth is not just a storehouse or a sewer. It's living. It's a living system. Mm -hmm. And we are a living part of this living body of Earth. What a time to be able to uh, join and work uh, for this. And I think that although the media is uh, certainly doesn't devote any space to revealing this. I think this is spreading around the world, that more and more people are acting on behalf of the larger system, yes. larger the earth itself. Yes, I see that, that we, I mean, absolutely we are waking up to that. You know, as I said, it's kind of a both-and times. And Could you speak uh, about the great turning and what that is? Yeah, I think that there is a trans. It's clear that there's a transition underway uh, to a life. I won't say a sustainable society because that word has been misused, but a life-sustaining culture. And this is probably the biggest revolution. And I agree with the social thinkers that say it's the biggest revolution since the agricultural revolution. 10,000 years ago, or the um, Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. We are uh, seeing the uh, that we have to uh, fit in with the laws and patterns and rights of the natural world, mm-hmm. uh, or we're uh, goners. Yeah, we are one species of many millions of species. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I I would like to ask you, given that uh, this country was founded upon a legacy of genocide and imperialism, especially against indigenous peoples, it seems we were destined for a correction. And I wonder if what we're experiencing now, you consider, let's say, the U.S.'s karma. I think most of our listeners are familiar with the, the laws of cause and effect. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's any question about that. And it's not only that we have stolen the land, but we have grown wealthy with stolen people. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, centuries of slavery are also ready for a uh, A correction. Yes. Huge. And this is a period where we have to uh, open our, and we're opening our eyes to that. And it's very demanding. Uh, it's demanding for every one of us. For me, as a white identified woman, mm-hmm. it meant up seeing things that I hadn't been uh, conditioned to see and know that are absolutely uh, essential for for me to know to open my heart mind to what is happening to uh, my brothers and sisters of color in this country and in this world. Because we are, um, uh, there's a huge karma of, of colonialism sure. in our country and, and, and actually worldwide. Yeah, I, 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 and it is, a, as you said, an auspicious time because people are waking up to that and, and more and more people are taking responsibility for that. I mean, maybe it hasn't happened worldwide yet, but there's definitely a shift underway. That's right. It's, it does, actually, it's, it's um, morally beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and people want to come together. I mean, I feel that a lot of the times when you're out, whether it's a rally or a march or you're doing something on behalf of a cause much greater than ourselves, that that is the whole reason people want to do that. They want to come together. They actually, there's a part of them that wants to be in community with others because this society is so isolating. If you just stay in I think material you're totally culture. right, Carrie. There's a huge longing uh, for... Uh, for this mutual belonging, because that is our actually, uh, we're made for that. Yes, yes. We're right. not made to 
be sitting in an isolation cell. Absolutely. We should be relational. Does it shock you that we haven't yet implemented a wartime level mobilization on behalf of Mother Earth? You know, I remind myself of Paul Hawkins' statements often that, you know, right now there's over 100,000 private companies on the case of climate change in the environment. Yeah, it is. Um, and yet, uh, down among the young people, it's moving, too, to see how natural it feels to younger people to have their eyes open to what is in store and what is happening and to shift their identity. Or they don't need to shift their identity. There is a readiness to uh, act uh, not with a lot of drama and breastfeeding and flag waving, but just very naturally. Oh, yeah, we're here for the earth. Yes, absolutely. Some activists have an aversion, and some have an identification with the word activist. Do you find anything problematic about identifying oneself as an activist? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it, it, it puzzles me <laughs> that people are... Uh, seem to take it as being aggressively militant or self-righteous. <laughs> to me, active, an activist is anybody who acts for something uh, wider than their immediate self-interest. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the younger generation who might be more angry or they feel that what the prior generations have left is, is a very sad inheritance and that we've you know, acted irresponsibly and negligently. What do you have to say to these younger listeners? Yeah, well, I would say you can stay uh, with that um, sense of um, putting all the blame on uh, the older generation. It's totally understandable. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to blame you, but actually it's boring. <laughs> you're not going to find out. You're not going to have a lot of adventures. <laughs> you're you're going to sit with that. Yeah, I'm not going to solve too much. You there and, and point at the olders and, okay, if that's where you want to enjoy life, that there's a lot of uh, adventures out there for you to have that will be, and you can have the experience of those ever-widening circles of self-interest. There's circles of identity and people to work with. So don't waste your time on that is what I'd want to say to them. Yeah, and then they miss out on a whole uh, other opportunities for creativity and collaboration with others. Yeah. So. You sure do, because there's so much. It's such a it's such a thrilling thing to be able to step beyond the consumer self that uh, capitalism is b built on in our whole um, economic system uh, has been built on, and that keeps us actually infantilized. Yes, and enslaved in a certain sense. I, I yeah. you know, we're experiencing cultural genocide worldwide in the form of globalization and urbanization, and I, I would like you to comment on the erosion of the world's cultural heritage and the flattening of diversity. Yeah, I, I, this is uh, touches one of my uh, greatest sorrows is that there are uh, cultures and languages that are just winking out so fast and that and once you once you have a culture go extinct or a language a language is a whole precious precious way to uh, see the world and the world our planet expresses herself through a language, mm -hmm. through some of these uh, indigenous cultures so exquisitely and unrepeatably. So, he, Carrie, you just touched a big wound in my heart, <laughs> mind, and of, uh, that to go and and I did to um, hang out with the uh, those who are where you still have these wonderful. Uh, ways of seeing and being human uh, before, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's just one more reason to uh, serve this, because it's going to be inevitable. The, the capitalism is self-destroying. Mm -hmm. Marx was right about that. Mm -hmm. and, that uh, and as we 
And maybe it's too late. But that doesn't mean that we can't right now in with with appetite and love in our hearts and great curiosity uh, work with each other in uh, treasuring what we have right now. Yeah. Uh, final words, Joanna. I'm wondering what would you most like to see change in your lifetime given your long-time advocacy for ecological and social justice? Oh. Is it too big of a question? <laughs> too big of a wish list? Oh, yeah. Well, I would like to see uh, the United States uh, break up into a smaller countries. Mm. I bet you they never <laughs> expect to say that. Yeah, well. And I would like to see people uh, uh, coming together uh, in the streets uh, and not be so acquiescent to the uh, tyranny and folly of those who are temporarily in power. I want to see people uh, taking each other's hands and walking out to demand uh, that uh, the obvious, mm-hmm. that the uh, life uh, go on, and the uh, insane policies of the present, uh, admit of the, yeah. Yeah, demand yeah. that life go on, I like that. Joanna, could you share with us your website and the ways that the listeners can stay in contact with you? Well, uh, they can write me care of uh, the website for the work that reconnects. The work that reconnects. It's called, and, and it's work, not the work, but work that reconnects.org. And they can uh, uh, write me in care of that. Okay. The work that reconnects.org, is that right? Yes, but without the word the. Okay. Work that reconnects.org, listeners. You can connect with Joanna Macy. Stay tuned with her, please. And you have been listening to eco philosopher and Buddhist scholar Joanna Macy on Eco Justice Radio 90.7 KPFK. Thank you so much, Joanna. And thank you, Carrie. Lovely to be with you. We appreciate your wisdom. And that is it for our show. Thank you for tuning in to Eco Justice Radio here on 90.7 KPFK. I want to thank Joanna Macy for coming on the show. Eco Justice Radio is brought to you by SoCal 350 and KPFK. Executive producer Mark Morris. Interview hosted by Carrie Kim and original music by Javier Cadre. My name is J.P. Morris. And until next time, remember, the power is yours.